thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and today we're taking a look at race in America. It seems to have become a topic number one of late with racial incidents, a part of so many of our lives, our news, and our politics. Today's show is part one of a two-part series. With us today, Tina Beth Pina, Emmy Award-winning journalist, actor, and host of CUNY TV's Urban U. Dr. Kevin Nadal, a professor at John Jay College and the CUNY Grad Center, an author of Microaggression and Traumatic Stress, and Laura Flanders, host of the Laura Flanders Show here at CUNY TV, of course, and host of the weekly podcast and the commentary, The F Word. Well, the F word for a feminist, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Founders, I think. Thanks to you all <laughs> so much. We all belong in some way to CUNY, the City University. And Kevin and I were talking earlier about the sheer numbers of people who belong to the City University of New York, a quarter of a million students. And I think it's almost a half a million when you add the rest of the staff. That is a huge population and a very diverse student population here as well. So here we are, members of that large family, uh, a major uh, influence in the city of New York, and each of us has something to do with race. Now, I usually start the show by asking our guests to place themselves in black America, but this time I'm saying place yourself in racial America. I don't want to say racist America quite yet. We'll see where we'll end up <laughs> at, the we end, at the end of the, of the show. So Tina Beth, where do you, where do you fit in racially in America? Racially, I am what is known as Latinx, previously learn, known as Hispanic or Latina. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's a new, new word. That's a yeah. new word, Latinx. Yes. Uh, I was born and raised in Eastern Pennsylvania, and my mom's from Puerto Rico. My dad's from the Dominican Republic. Uh huh. right. And, so, and issues of, of, of uh, problems with race as a Latinx? For me personally, no, but I think I've had a different experience than other people growing up. I grew up in a town um, at the time where we were really the only people that were not like the others, um, which you would think could be a problem, but it wasn't. Um, I think it was because of how we interacted with everybody in the town. And in the school that I went to, I was, the again, the only one not like the others in school. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Maybe in kindergarten, people, you know, would say the N-word, believe it or not, in kindergarten as a five-year-old and because they learned that from their parents. Sure. So when I came home crying, uh, my mother was like, no, 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 don't worry, you know, call them a name back and <laughs> stand up for yourself. <laughs> That's your mom, a fe feisty mom. My mother's oh, a very feisty oh. mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm the grandmother of small children. <clears throat> the four-year-olds in preschool, you know, had to fight their way through being, uh, uh, taking racial slurs, so... Uh, so we've been we've been through that. We didn't quite say we didn't have the nerve to say call to another name back. It's like that's not nice. You know, <laughs> we're, we're not feisty enough. Laura, your experience. Gosh, well, I'm just wishing. Gosh, isn't Latinx a great phrase? I, I wish we had sort of uh, Anglo X. I guess is, is where I would find myself. My Anglo American. Yes. My mother's American. My father was British. I'm definitely on the creepy white colonial edge of the racial spectrum. I grew up in the UK in a primary school that was minority white and then went to a um, middle and, school. And how, how was that? It was because we were in a part of town that had a very large South Asian population. Uh -huh. South Asian, West Indian. Um, it was a public school, I just to say a state school. Uh, but then a huge shift when I turned 12. Suddenly went into a private school system where there was only one black girl in the girls' school class that I was in. And a totally different environment. So I felt like I came to, when I came to the U.S., I had this vision of the United States as a place of, I would always say, you know, everything you want in England, the answer is always no, <laughs> even if actually you can probably get it down the road if you persuade someone. And here the answer was always yes, even if it was completely not possible. Um, so it was a place of possibility, and I think to me that possibility was also mixed with racial diversity. I had this vision of this is a place that's more mixed and more interesting, and you can be more versions of yourself and have a more diverse life mm. um, only to discover that wasn't quite, that, not uh, quite as simple as that. Not quite, not quite yet or a still. Kevin? 
So I am Filipino American. I grew up in California uh, as a Filipino American. Uh, my experiences with race are very complicated because a lot of times uh, people don't know where to place us. And so as a result, uh, I personally and my community, we experience a spectrum of uh, forms of racial discrimination, uh, depending on if people perceive us as being Asian American, if people perceive us as being Latino, Latinx, people perceive us as being mixed race or mixed with black or black American um, people. Uh, treat us in, in those different ways. And so uh, navigating race was something that I learned to do from a very early age, um, from everything from people uh, presuming I didn't speak English, uh, to police officers following mm -hmm. us around in stores, to uh, you know hearing racial slurs. Um, and so it was something that uh, uh, definitely became part of just my everyday lived experience. I I'm fascinated by your work because you're a specialist in microaggression which uh, you say has been around for 10 years, so that name has been around for 10 years. To me, I've only heard it like every single day in the last two years, but <laughs> talk to us a little bit about that because you sure. talk about microaggression and trauma, not just stress, but real trauma. Sure, yeah, so the term microaggressions was first coined by a black American uh, professor named Chester Pierce in the 1970s. However, it didn't really gain a lot of traction and part of it is because people were dealing with uh, overt racism and hate crimes and that sort of thing that we didn't really have time to even think about the subtle uh, slights that people experience as a result of race. And so in 2007, uh, my mentor, Daryl Wing Su, and our research team, uh, we published uh, an article in which we tried to bring back the term microaggressions. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, there have been uh, tens of thousands of articles written about microaggressions, hundreds of research studies written about microaggressions, to the point that now the term is uh, part of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Absolutely, absolutely. So you're right, in the past couple of years it's gained more traction and you know we have uh, media to thank for that as well and, and young people have really uh, just been really great in, in educating people about uh, this uh, term because it's something that maybe they deal uh, with frequently because of the more subtle nature of it. Sure, and it is subtle. Give us an example in, in your mind of what is subtle. But you're, talk you're really talking about the accumulation that can result in and, and enormous pain. Sure. So there is a, a lot. There are a lot of different examples. Uh, some of the ones I just mentioned before, being presumed to not speak English, is a common microaggression that Asian Americans and Latinx people experience. Being followed around in stores, or being presumed to be uh, criminal, or things that African Americans and Latinx uh, people might experience. Um, but there are also like even subtler things. Um, so things like when you're in your workplace uh, and you you get the sense that people uh, are leaving you out of things um, where you can't quite pinpoint that it's because of your race but you recognize that you're the only person of color or you're the only woman or the only LGBTQ person um, and that something just feels differently to you uh, and the accumulative uh, nature of that um, causes anxiety depression research has found uh, can even lead to physical health issues uh, but my newest line of research is looking at trauma that the uh, the overwhelming number of events that uh, experience, people experience related to race and microaggressions that they build upon each other to uh, formulate this microaggressive trauma. Right. Yeah. I was just talking with someone earlier this morning who had difficulty with uh, childbirth. And we now, there's now research that suggests that the reason that black women have a high mortality rate and infant mortality rate is this aggression or microaggression where actually the genetic shape of the body, you know, or the cells mm -hmm. uh, is affected by uh, by dealing with the stress. So much of this, Laura, has to do with white privilege. Not that I'm pointing at you and say, <laughs> 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 but, but that seems to be the big where so many people will say, what are you talking about, yeah. white privilege? Yeah, I mean, I think this has been part of the work of our generation, right? And certainly of the last, I don't know, decade or so that we seem to have been able to uh, sort of make visible so much information around the experience of people of color. And I think that white people still are desperately lagging in researching our own experience of white privilege. It's not as simple to say, well, we have our own trauma from being white. Obviously, that's a shedding of difference. And I think that white studies has gotten a bad name for sort of equalizing difference. Um, but white supremacy is a phrase that at least we're talking about now. And we have to get very real about it. I mean, I looked at the statistics in the last midterm elections and found them 
exasperating. I mean, it was bad in, in 2016, where you had 56% of white women voting for Trump over Hillary Clinton. But in the election for governor in Georgia, you had 75% of white women voting for Brian Kemp. Right. Against Stacey Abrams, who would have been the first um, woman of color go uh, governor in any state. And hopefully the next senator there. Well, I hope she has an extraordinary future. I mean, this was an amazing right. candidacy. And, and it's not to say there weren't extraordinary women who worked for her, and of course there were, and it wasn't all white women. And I think in 2016, I kind of protect, you know, sought refuge in my right on queer left, um, unmarried. Um, status. I'm not like those white women. And it was true, you know. Well, unmarried women, right. Exactly. Unmarried right. women, queer Single. women, right. urban women, college right. educated, non-Christian, non-Christian identified, um, tend to have our heads screwed on a little bit better. <laughs> um, but we can't, I really got it this time. It's like, yeah. well, I can't run away from that. I have to figure out how to deal with this reality that white supremacy continues to enable me to be a woman in a different kind of way than women of color. I get to be female in a different kind of way. I get to be vulnerable in a different kind of way. I get to be perceived as beautiful in a different kind of way. I live longer, mm -hmm. something like three years longer than particularly African-American women. I have, uh, I think, 10 times as much wealth on average as your average African-American woman, um, if not more than that. I mean, the I statistics for, for are very clear. I think the it's hundred or less, five hundred dollars or less. Yeah, I mean, it's, <coughs> yeah. it's tiny. So, so I think there are very real benefits to being a white woman in America, and right. I think a lot of white women are still grasping hold of that, and we have to deal with it. So, uh, Latinx, uh, from that perspective, we just celebrated a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, Latina Equal Pay Day. Mm -hmm. So that's in October when. That's for the first time that a, a, the average uh, of a, a Latina woman will have made what a white man made in all of 2017, let's say. Mm -hmm. So it takes that many months before it's equal. Uh, the response and very, very little progress in that, in that regard. You know, it's interesting when I hear that, when I hear your experience and your experiences, because sometimes I feel as a Latina that sometimes other Latinas, and I can't speak for all of them, Sometimes people have a chip on their shoulder and- Who um, has the chip? Certain uh, minority groups. Right, right. Um, you know, they're against me, they're looking at me, so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. I only have those type of experiences when I, when I allow those experiences to define me, if that makes any sense. What I've always tried to do it since I was a little girl, since I've had that experience in kindergarten, is if you try to define me, I push back and I don't let you define me. And I unfortunately think when it comes to pay, when it comes mm -hmm. to um, being looked at in a store um, because you might steal something, it or if you have some type of privilege, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. for some people, I think they're allowing that to happen. And I, and I know people will look at that and say, oh, how, how could she possibly say that? And it's because I've had that experience. I can go in a store looking like this, nobody will bother me. I'll go in a store with sweatpants, no makeup on, looking like a hood rat, and you're gonna follow me. Hmm. Now, which way am I gonna go in the store? I'm gonna go nicely dressed. So I'm making an effort to present myself in such a way so that A, I can make a good living, I can make more money, I can do whatever I need to do to get ahead in life. And I think sometimes people allow their color of their skin or whatever the, yeah. the world views are to right. affect them and then thus having I, a chip on the shoulder. Like I said, that's not a popular I view, understand, but that's I my view. I understand the point of view, but you know, it, it reminds me of the hoodie, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, that almost as if you wear a hoodie, you deserve to be shot, you know? Oh, you don't, of course. Right, so I mean, there, therein is the issue, you know, of, of having to present yourself in a, an extraordinarily accepted way in order to be accepted as opposed to being who you are. Right. I, yeah, I mean, I understand where you're coming from. And at the same time, we also have to recognize there are a lot of systemic issues involved that you can dress up as nicely as you like. You can get elected to Congress um, and still be viewed as a Latina woman who isn't smart enough, isn't. But uh, prove them wrong. 
Right, right. However, there's also the statistics that you are going to be one of the few up there. You're still going to get paid less. Uh, and so the systems are, are part of uh, the issue. And back to the hoodie issue is like, it, regardless of if you try to present yourself in a different way, you can be a black man who's dressed in a hoodie, a black man dressed in a suit and still get shot by police officers, as we're seeing. You could be a security officer who's saving the lives of people. And then when the police officers show up, get killed. Um, and that doesn't even make national news. Um, and so those are still some of the systemic issues. So I think there's a balance between trying to prove them wrong and trying to you know, be your best self uh, with also the realization that there are still so many systemic issues uh, that regardless of how hard people of color work, the how hard uh, women work, how hard uh, women of color work, that you're still not going to get paid as much as people. And if you allow it. No, no because not. systemically that is I true. That's, I don't think that's true. I don't know. It's if yeah. you but, allow it. And then mm -hmm. the whole thing with the race relations, I just take issue with it lots of times because you always have the white cop versus um, the black person that got shot. There are a lot of cops of color out there mm -hmm. who, you know, look upon these other cops who unfortunately are being represented. I have a big thing with cops because my husband is a cop. Mm -hmm. So I take issue with lots of right. that because lots of times the men in blue don't get to speak for is themselves. Is he Latino? No, he's not. He's, he's a what? white cop who uh -huh. used to work in Harlem. Okay. Okay. So there, there's a lot of issues around that. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes I take offense to statements such as those simply because we're not looking at the whole picture. Mm. Lots of times, yes, did a white cop shoot an unarmed black person or shoot an unarmed person of color who's trying to help. Absolutely. That particular police officer shouldn't have been on the force to begin with. And for whatever reason, systemically, they're on the force. But what it's about the other cops? Though. I mean, I think that when you want to talk systemically, and you want to talk systems, you want to talk structures, I mean, I think what, what I'm hearing responded to here is the sense of, we can't individualize this problem. We can't privatize the problem. The fact that you're failing to thrive in a society that is so skewed, um, where the numbers are so clear, um, isn't your fault, clearly. You, there is an intersection between your own engagement and the structure as it's been set up. But then you look at an institution like the police force, and you have to say the roots of this institution lie in the maintenance of slavery. That is a very specific root of an institution. So has that institution changed in the way that it needs to to address the society that we live in today? No. These were the you know the slave catchers and the slave you know recoverers and the returners back to the slaveholders. This is an institution that was employed in the maintenance of Jim Crow. This is an institution that has had a, you know, a, a um, synchronistic, you know, a, a, what's it called, a mutually beneficial relationship with white supremacy, armed and unarmed throughout the history of this country. So we can get to the place, I think, where we say, okay, let's talk about how we're going to live in a way where everybody feels relatively secure. I don't believe there's such a thing as perfect security for anybody, and it's a dream for us to think that we are perfectly secure uh, because of our race. But I think that there is a discussion that we need to have about community, security, what do we need to live well with each other. Um, that whole life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness thing Kevin, has to come down to, yeah. you know, more things than just are you a good cop or a bad person in a hoodie. Yeah, you've worked with the NYPD. Yes. Uh, advising yes. them. So. Yeah, so I mean, working with MIPD itself is something that I can speak personally about and knowing that there are lots of systemic issues there that for the longest time they did not talk about uh, this thing called implicit bias. And I agree, it's not just white police officers, it's also officers of color uh, that are killing innocent uh, men of color. Um, this past uh, couple of years ago, there was uh, Peter Liang who uh, killed uh, 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 in uh, New York. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, just to, to understand that it's, it's that that's part of the system. That is, I'm not saying that all white police officers are bad. I'm not saying all police officers are bad. Um, but what I'm saying is that the system needs to be improved, that there's a problem when uh, there are a disproportionate amount of young black men that are being killed by police officers, that regardless of whether that one individual is good, if the system is not uh, correcting that in some way, they're not training their officers, uh, they're, not, uh, uh, they're not even uh, putting those officers on 
on leave um, or that they're being put on a paid leave, um, that that's a systemic issue. Um, I think that there are ways that police uh, departments across the country are trying to address it. Um, many people would say they're not trying hard enough or it's not quick enough, um, but it's still part of this, this overall system. And it, I do believe that it also goes back to slavery, that it's not just the police officers and departments, it's the history of slavery and how it seeps in to all aspects of our lives, to the criminal justice system, um, to police force, to educational Which, system. Yeah, if we, lo if we look at the prison, prisons now are full of uh, people who were inequitably sentenced to hugely long. Uh, so what, what do you think about, or do you think about the criminal justice system since you're in the, in the family there and, and the, the preponderance of people of color behind, behind bars? Oh, I think it's an absolute shame because there's definitely people of color that are in the criminal, you know, justice system. The criminal, yeah, the, the system. The system. <laughs> yeah, I don't, there's, there's no justice there. Right. That shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. um, and there are um, a large amount of people that, that should be there. I hear a lot of um, who gets arrested and why they get arrested for different reasons. And they deserve to be arrested. Um, and, I, you know, mm -hmm. I can't say anything definitive because I can't. Um, but it's, it's just a shame the way our system works. Mm -hmm. that, I, that, that I'll say emphatically. I have a long list of people who deserve to be arrested. Can I, can I, can I give it to you? <laughs> so let's, let's, let's talk a little bit. We don't have all of that much time, but it seems to me that the last couple of years with our uh, new president, we are operating in a system where race has become, has risen to the top. But I wouldn't say race, I would say hate. <laughs> uh, let's listen to, if we can, uh, order to the clip of our president recently. On the campaign trail, you called yourself a nationalist. Some people saw that as emboldening white nationalists. Now people are also saying that the president. I don't know why you'd that say that. It's such a racist there question. There are some people. Sit down, please. Sit down. I didn't call you. I didn't call you. I didn't call you. I'll give you voter suppression. Excuse me, I'm not responding to you. I'm talking to this gentleman. Will you please sit down? The same thing with April Ryan. I watch her get up. I mean, you talk about somebody that's a loser. She doesn't know what the hell she's doing. She gets publicity, and then she gets a pay raise, or she gets a contract with, I think, CNN. But she's very uh, nasty. Do you accept that would occur to be involved in the Russia probe? Do you want him to... It's up to him. Do you want him to rein in Robert Mueller? What a stupid question that is. What a stupid question. But I watch you a lot. You ask a lot of stupid questions. So all of that, uh, uh, it's, it's an assault on the media. It's assault on mostly women of color, uh, where he feels uh, com completely comfortable calling them stupid, racist, uh, et cetera. Uh, your response? Yeah, I mean, this is an example of uh, overt types of um, microaggressions. Uh, he would not... Isn't uh, that macro, though? It, it is. It is. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that there is a, a type of microaggression that we call microassaults, ah. where the person uh, will claim that they don't have any biases, when in reality we know that they have implicit biases, whether they recognize it or not. Um, and so clearly he has issues with women of color, and particularly black women. Um, clearly he has issues with women in general. Uh, but the... The, the notion is that uh, he feels like he could put them in their place. Uh, and so back to the original point, those women are likely, I don't know them personally, but wonderful, smart, talented journalists, um, no matter how hard they work, they're going to be viewed in a certain way by this man because he's in power and he can put them in their place. And it's not just them who are, who are being viewed. I mean, he is being viewed by white, by white nationalists and mm -hmm. white supremacists all across the country as giving license. I mean, I think he is sending a message as much to them as he is to Abby and the people like her. Well, I mean, Charlottesville, he is, he is on my list on all of sides. He's on my list I mean. of people to get arrested for sure. Um, <laughs> but you know, we have to remember that this has been a climate that has been unleashed here or been revealed, surfaced here, that led to you know how many death threats, uh, how many bomb threats, yep. how many people have been you know actual bombs, actual, actual bombs, shooting. yeah, actual shootings. I mean, I was down at the African burial ground in New York City not so long ago, uh, and a friend of mine called me down there because she said, you have to come and see what's happened here. Now, this is a block mm -hmm. that is, I think, one of the most surveilled blocks in New York City. The big federal building is directly opposite ICE, Homeland Security, the FBI. You've got a police head 
headquarters, a police precinct at one end of the block. You've got the IRS at the other. There are roadblocks at both sides. Nobody going to and fro except for police and FBI uh, military, you know, the federal military, federal police service. Yeah, um, and somebody had graffitied, somebody had graffitied this. Sure on the African burial ground, the burial ground of 15,000 um, Africans in, and free blacks in, in the first part of colonial New York history. This is almost felt to me like a test. If I can write kill and the N word in clear writing mm. with a marker on this display plaque at this place that is well visited, yeah. that it's, everyone stops to say, what's going on here? Why is there this patch of grass? Um, in front of, I think, half, I counted half a dozen surveillance cameras. Mm -hmm. And they didn't come up with a suspect for two weeks, and they didn't detain him for three weeks. And we have yet to see mm -hmm. the video footage. I feel like there's, a, there's, a, there's not just a license being given to people, but I think we are being structurally, institutionally tested. How much will we take? Mm -hmm. and, and that really is the, the question, right? How much can we take without forcing someone to do something? But I also think when you have an ignorant leader, ignorance is gonna rise to the surface as well because he's saying it's okay, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I also feel like- I don't think he's ignorant at all. Oh, I think he's extremely, he's a smart person, but he's ign an ignorant person. He in knows my exactly how to use the media. He knows exactly how to rile up a crowd. He knows how to win a game show. He's done all of the above and he's using race as his primary tool. I don't think he knows. I think it's the handlers who are telling him what to do and how to do it. I personally think he's ignorant. Because when he's speaking and he's pointing fingers and saying, you're racist, you're stupid, blah, blah, blah. Where's the one, the other finger pointing right back at you? You're the racist one. You're the stupid well, one. That's true. But so, but, and, and that's how, that's how I feel. I, I think he has a lot of great handlers. He has a mind, I guess, for business, clearly, since the name Trump is on every building. Thanks to his father. Um, exactly. Right. But I think it's his handlers that, that okay. have allowed him to. Well, fortunately for us, we have another part. We have part two of our conversation race. We're just getting started, so it would seem. But for now, our thanks to Laura Flanders, Tina Beth Pena, and Kevin Nadal. Uh, be on the lookout for part two of Race in America next week. Thank you for joining us. I'm Carol Jenkins. The show is Black America. We'll definitely see you for part two.